uh, let me welcome Andres Aurelio uh, from the University of Chile, where he's an assistant professor. Uh, great that you can uh, that you made it, and uh, yeah, looking forward to your presentation today. Um, he earned a PhD from the University of Melbourne, and then in computer science, and then uh, worked for some time at the MIT Media Lab. I guess we was here together. Um, and then after being a scientist at the University of Southern California, he's now at the University of Chile, uh, which is, I guess, in, in Santiago, uh, I assume. Um, and he's working on yeah, algorithms in the society, design of social computing systems. So I guess very relevant work for what we do here at, at CHM using methods from behavioral science, game theory, and also yeah, experimental tools. And yeah, when, when uh, praying for, for this introduction, I went over your profile. Just like quite a, quite a few interesting uh, pieces there. Uh, so for instance, what stuck out to me, and which was quite relevant to my own work, was actually uh, your work on hybrid forecasting systems. Yeah, I mean, you did it for um, for geopolitical events, which is, uh, I mean, I'm an economist, uh, no long <laughs> like what I do, but uh, like combining humans and machines um, for forecasting. So uh, it was quite quite interesting, and they're like uh, discussing, so to say, that the trade-offs and mistrust that, that humans have in those systems sometimes. Um, so yeah, I uh, can recommend this to everyone um, to check it out. I think the, the talk today is about something else, so uh, looking forward to this as well. And yeah, please take it away. Great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invitation, and it's great to see such a multidisciplinary audience uh, because basically that's where I, I, I focus, especially in. I think the field is called computational social science. Um, what I think I bring to the table is more of an uh, algorithmic perspective because my background is in computer science and algorithms and, and, and basically complexity science. So, so I think uh, one of the key kind of keywords I bring to my work is optimization. So the idea here is try to model uh, socio-technical systems and try to optimize them uh, toward better social outcomes. That's kind of the main idea I want to bring today. Uh, so that needs kind of three ingredients. It's modeling uh, the social, the human behavior, the algorithmic behavior, and then the interaction between them. So you, then we can actually uh, kind of prove uh, counterfactual outcomes when we change the, what is the impact of changing the algorithms in the social, in the collective behavior. So uh, today I'm going to kind of talk about two works that kind of bring this perspective. And so if you can, who is changing the slides? Uh, Grecia, if you can go um, to the next one. Yeah, yes. So yeah, so, so basically um, uh, the idea here is that we already are kind of in this ubiquitous world where algorithms uh, interact with us and mediate what we choose, what we kind of interact with in, in the digital market. So I like to think that the, in, in these kind of markets, like uh, cultural markets where where we choose what to hear, what to um, buy and what to eat, uh, algorithms kind of mediate and connect us between a full and a huge kind of um, uh, there's so many choices that we need algorithms to help us curate uh, these kind of ever-growing um, data. So this kind of creates an interaction between individual choices and collective opinion, which is responsible of a lot of the complexity of serving these cultural markets. And in fact, if you go to the next one, uh, I'd like to bring forward these kind of uh, perspective that appeared in already in 2021, but it was in nature and it was a uh, whole nature gave uh, emphasis to what is computational social science. And especially there was the paper by Wagner and colleagues that talked about algorithmically infused societies, which is very relevant to, to my work today because it actually talks about how uh, we need not only um, we, we are observing new kind of relates how we relate with the algorithms is different from before, but also we need kind of new measurement models, new theoretical constructs, and especially because there is these feedback loops. And I like this figure that is from that paper because actually we're going to talk about two systems. One is the dating recommendations, which is work that we did uh, with Ijad and colleagues, and also about recommendations. Um, 
uh, recommendations now appear in basically when you go to YouTube, when you hear music, when you go and read the media or on the social media. So the idea here is that not only um, human decision interacts with the algorithms, but the algorithms also interact creating this feedback loop. And the idea in these two works that I'm going to show is, is how kind of we can model this kind of interaction. So with that introduction, I'll go and start with the first kind of study, which is about ranking and recommendations in cultural markets. So if you can go to the next slide. Yeah. Yes. So this work uh, done was done during my started during my PhD thesis, and basically is how to model these kind of feedback loops. So the idea is that when you go and kind of consume information in in the in, in the cultural markets, especially. Uh, there's platform providers basically have to decide what to show you, how to show you. And uh, this is done through recommendation systems that aggregate social information from many users. So this can distort a little bit the market. Uh, basically, it's already been discussed a lot in, in very in a lot of papers, for example, popularity bias where there's an amplification of a few products that are very popular and the system recognizes this and starts showing them to all people. So it's already been kind of recognized that these recommendation systems can amplify certain um, biases in data. So what is the algorithm doing? The algorithm is trying to decide what to show and how to display the products. So imagine when you go and search in Google search, uh, most of you probably don't even go to the second page. So, so even though you, you, the Google search give you thousands or so of results, probably you only want to read the first 10. So this is a decision of the algorithm in a way that kind of obscures or, or makes uh, a long tail where many products are never going to be clicked by, by users. So if you go to the second, the next one, please. So. You can also see it in a lot of other media, for example, New York Times has this idea of uh, trending news. So it, I, I guess it's not clear how they kind of rank it, but it probably is by number of views or clicks, etc. So they already give you like a popularity ranking where um, news that are most seen are going to be ranked uh, higher and this actually creates that they're going to keep being popular. And if you go to the next one in YouTube, you have the same idea. You also have this uh, trending kind of ranking, uh, uh, the same idea through views. So, so it kind of amplifies this popularity. Yeah. So this is ranking by popularity is a very simple kind of algorithmic decision, but it's very ubiquitous in various, in various of these uh, systems. And in fact, even though when systems are kind of doing this personalized recommendation. I'm, I'm not going to focus on, on that today, but a lot of papers already shown that personalized recommendation systems also have this kind of popularity kind of bias. And if you go to the next work, next, sorry, the next slide. Uh, this work actually kind of starts with this uh, seminal work by Duncan, by Salganic, Dots and Watts, in, appeared in Science 2006. Um, so it's, it's a very important paper because, in fact, uh, as far as I know, it's one of the first papers that did like a high scale uh, social experiment with more than 5,000 people that maybe today doesn't sound that big, but it was one of the first in, in that time. Um, what they did was a really nice experiment uh, where they actually recreated kind of a lot of, let's say, kind of um, music markets, very similar to a simple like a Spotify, where users could go into the market and they could see a lot of songs and the number of downloads that I already have the song, and then they can interact with basically with the system, hear the music, and and, and, and basically, when you hear a, a song, it increases the number of downloads. 
So the experiment condition, they created eight worlds, eight worlds with social influence. So they started, the initial condition is the same, basically zero, uh, zero downloads for each zone. And then people start joining the market and, and it kind of uh, progresses. And what is interesting, they also created one kind of independent condition, which is without social influence. So it's the same idea but people don't see the number of previous downloads. So this is kind of the control group. And if you go to the next slide, the main finding of this music lab experiment is that when you correlate, when you see, so in the X axis, is the market share, the number of downloads of the songs in, the, in this independent world. So it's um, basically, a good proxy of what the quality of the song is, and in the y-axis is the market share of the songs in each uh, world, but with social influence. So what this shows is that there is a good correlation between this proxy of quality and popularity, but also uh, in in some some worlds, uh, basically there is a lot of unpredictability. So. So if you see, for example, the uh, I, you don't see my mouse, but if you see the, the last basically row of points, that is basically one song, which is the most uh, the better quality song or the most popular song in independent world. And if you can see what it means that it's all around in the Y axis, it means that in one condition it was very popular, but in another world it was kind of a low rank. So basically the main finding is here the, is that popularity when there is social influence is not a good proxy of quality. And, this, and the other one is that there is a lot of unpredictability of success. In fact, uh, this is kind of the, the idea of cumulative advantage where the initial conditions kind of uh, create uh, um, this cumulative advantage of a few songs that are the first ones click and then they go up in the ranking and they are being shared. So there was a, why this happened is because there was a critical choice in the algorithm and basically uh, songs in the social influence world were ranked by popularity. So basically the first songs here, they were ranked at the, uh, at the top and they keep being on the top. So this is why uh, basically um, these songs were distorted and social influence kind of uh, created the, these distortions between quality and popularity. So if you go to the next slide, is where basically our contribution comes, and we we're thinking here is that is that well, if the ranking kind of creates this distortion, we can also use another ranking uh, to kind of mitigate this popularity bias. So here's where we wanna kind of optimize the ranking to improve that somebody that. Uh, so here is like, a, if you think about is when you buy, you go to a, buy a book, you don't know the quality after you finish with the reading the book. So, so you want to have a, a good signal of basically help you choose the best book or the book you're going to enjoy the most or the song you're going to enjoy the most. So that, that's kind of what we want to optimize. And for that, like I said at the beginning, we need kind of two ingredients. The first one is kind of a modeling how people uh, choice, how they choose, the, 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 sorry, how they choose these songs. So we took a paper by Krum et al. in 2012 that they actually replicated via simulations and with this model, the, um, the music lab experiment, and we added an extra ingredient that was the ranking of the products. So this is a, it's a very simple equation. What it says is the following is that uh, the probability of a user choosing an item I at, the, um, at any time is proportional to the visibility. So basically visibility can be here the size of the song in the layout or the ranking. So if it appears on the top position, it's going to be more visible than if it's at the bottom. And that's why this B has a sigma. So basically here's what we are going to the freedom of liberty that we're going to choose is the position of the product in the ranking. So we can make it higher, more visible or less visible. And also it depends on kind of some intrinsic uh, appeal of the product, 
which we call A. It can be, for example, the, the name of the, the offer kind of give you some signal if you already know him or the, of the song. And then there is also proportional, the probability of choosing is also proportional to the social signal, which in this case is the number of downloads. So the more number of downloads it has, the more kind of it gives a positive signal that the user is more willing to, to choose it because it's, it's this social aggregation that uh, kind of give a consensus of a good quality. And, and basically once you kind of hear the song, then you actually kind of choose if you like it, kind of give a like or dislike based on, on the quality of the product. So, so this is kind of how we are going to model the, the human choices. And if you go to the next slide, what we're going to ask then is kind of optimize this market. So now we have basically a model of choice behavior. We want to now choose what is the optimal ranking and how do we want to optimize the ranking? Well, what we want to ask is basically we want users to maximize the, the probability of them choosing something that they like. So basically, uh, we choose this idea of maximizing social welfare. This is basically maximizing the probability for each user of liking something uh, that they like. Yeah. Um, I make so so this is nice because in this case, um, and we're gonna in the second study we're gonna see where this is not true. Is that here the social the better social outcome for users is basically clicking something they like. But it's also good for the market designer because it's equivalent to maximizing profit. Basically, you want to maximize that they like uh, something that they click. But this is, and we're going to show in the next study, that not always the maximizing social welfare for users is the best for the market designer. But in this case, uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's equivalent. So, so it's nice that social welfare and profit maximi maximization coincide in this market. So if we go to the next slide, now that we can actually, we, oh, oh sorry, this, this, I show the PDF, so you cannot see the, the dots, uh, that's a shame, but uh, let me see. Well, I'll, I can explain it anyway. So you can still see that, so in the left, here we recreated basically a simulation of the music lab on the left. And it actually surprisingly looked very similar to the real experiment of the music lab. So it's the same here is because he, this is an experiment with synthetic data. We actually know on the x-axis is the quality of the song and on the y-axis is the popularity. So what you can see here is that there is a good correlation between quality and popularity, but there is a lot of noise. So you can see on the upper right end what it means that each point is basically on, on a column is once is the same song but on different kind of initial conditions in, in different experiments so it can be all around the so sometimes a good quality song is the best seller but sometimes in another condition it's not a best seller and what we show through the simulations is you go to the right uh, kind of um, plot is the same idea, but now we use our uh, optimal ranking, and now the correlation is much higher, and there's much less predictability. So, sorry, there's more predictability. In fact, if you see the best quality song on the upper right, uh, you see it's very, it's kind of always one of the top seller songs. So basically, what we show here, or the main finding, is that using social influence doesn't necessarily a create an unpredictable market, but when used with a good uh, ranking algorithm, it actually improves the predictability. It makes uh, popularity and quality much more aligned. And so the next thing we wanted to do is actually see if these findings kind of um, have like a, the, the, we wanted to Proof from theory to practice. So we did an experiment, if you go to the next slide, where we actually replicated this music lab experiment, but with our new uh, ranking, which we call quality ranking. And here, instead of songs, we chose to do it with news, uh, actually scientific news, 
uh, I choose this, I forgot if it's science of nature, but every year at the end of the year, they, they, they put this list of science breakthroughs. So I choose like a, this scientific breakthroughs and I ask people to basically vote for which one they think is the, the, the best scientific breakthrough. So similar design as the music lab, we had people joining in and they can see two kind of worlds. One with social influence on the left, where it's kind of a, like a idea of the Facebook like button. So they can see um, the news, the number of likes, uh, and on the right, they had a independent condition where there was no social signal. And also notice that on the left, we also had different rankings. So in fact, the one on the left is not ranked by popularity. For example, to sleep per chance to clean is the most popular, but it's ranked fifth in the list. So, so this is here where we are gonna, instead of, um, we, we're gonna have four ranking policies, the random, then the popularity, and then what we call our optimal, or we, we call it a quality. And the quality one is also going to be with social signals, so showing the actual number of downloads, like on the left, and without social signal. So, in the next slide. <coughs> yeah, so we recruited via... This was a, actually, a, for me, on that time, a really good experience learning how to recruit people. Uh, I ended up, so I didn't want to pay people because the idea was to, I, I didn't want to incentivize them to basically work for money, but I wanted to recruit people to do it for free. So this was done via Google Ads. Uh, and actually we recruited 16,000, well, sorry, 1,600 people that for free they participated in basically voting for their top science stories. And so we had more or less like a four times four design where we had these four worlds, popularity, the quality with social influence, without, and a random without social influence. So that random without social influence is kind of our control group. And then we replicated four times each world. And the outcomes on the next slide, please. Okay. So now we can see the slides. So, okay, so here, uh, I think this is the main finding. So on the left, we start, no, uh, wait. So, okay, let's see the, on the right, the random ranking without social signals is basically a control group. So people come and they interact with the systems, but the, song, but the news are in random order and there's no, no social signal. So basically that, is where we infer a little bit, um, we can get our quality measure, our independent quality measure, and we contrast that with the other worlds. And so now we can go to the left one uh, with social influence, so we have the popularity ranking. Here, this is basically just as the Duncan Wall experiment. So uh, the first thing we can see is, so we have four worlds. So for example, what happens here is, um, there are four songs that were the top seller in each of the four uh, independent worlds. But if you notice, well, two times a good quality kind of news appear as a bestseller, but also on the left, two times, two types, the two most voted news were uh, low quality. So you see here already <laughs> happens with the popularity ranking, sometimes uh, good news appear as popular, but sometimes, in, in fact, in two, in half of the conditions, the kind of low quality news appeared as, uh, as a top seller. And in contrast to our ranking, so the one on the right, we see that the correlation between quality and popularity, it's uh, much higher. Yeah, so in basically there still is a lot of unpredictable, but uh, the correlation is much higher. In fact, none of the times the bestseller song was a low quality item. The other kind of main finding here is that if you compare the two plots of the left with social influence with the plots on the right without social influence, you can see that there is an emergence of uh, bestseller songs, best, oh, sorry, bestseller news on the left. You see, there is a, a 
always in each world there was one kind of uh, news that kind of uh, took most of the market shares compared with the rest. And this is actually something that is already well studied. This is caused by social influence. So this social signal creates a disparity and makes these bestseller songs uh, or bestseller news or bestseller items uh, match the, the, um, basically this kind of Pareto law where 20% of the products receive 80% of the attention. Where, so this kind of inequality doesn't appear in the world without social signals. So, so overall, we have like two kind of main findings that social influence creates this kind of uh, inequality, but when social influence with a good ranking is um, kind of introduced, then at least this, uh, the quality and the popularity are well aligned. So we cannot meet, we couldn't mitigate the inequalities caused by social influence, but at least we could align them with quality. So those are the main findings. And I'm gonna now switch to the next work. If you can go to the next slide. So this is actually recent work with, with Iyad. It was done while I, I started when I did my postdoc at MIT with Iyad, and it was only recently gonna appear on ACM Transactions and Economy. Um, and it's very interesting. So here we started kind of a similar framework. We also wanted to understand the impact of algorithms and how people choose. And our kind of, our inspiration was online dating. And here, as a position of before, you remember I told you that the optimization of the market coincided with the platform designer and the users. Here, we kind of wanted to see what happened when this is not true. So already in 1971, kind of Herbert Simon, which I always like to say that he is the only Turing Award and um, Nobel Prize in economy. And I recently found out he kind of basically based on his idea of thinking of we are not rational and heuristic uh, kind of thinking was one of the pioneers of inter uh, artificial intelligence. So, so very interesting uh, investigator. Um, here we also take inspiration of him by where he already kind of predicted that the business models of digital economies are going to be not kind of the currency, but basically retaining the interest of users. So the idea of the clicking economy is now, is not maximizing the social welfare of users, but the retention and basically maximizing clicks. So that's where we wanted to kind of compare you to the next slide in this kind of inspired by online dating, but actually it's much more general. It's basically what we call algorithmic matching, where we have a set of users that, that want to be matched to another set of users or products. Um, so on the one side on the left, what we think is kind of best for the, um, the system is to maximize the social welfare. So you want to assign matchings to users that maximize their, their utility. And we wanted to compare what is the loss of social welfare when basically the platform designer wants to maximize retention. So here is where we are going to focus uh, on modeling what is retention and how to kind of um, maximize it. So the idea is quantifying the social welfare loss so how much utility is lost by users when the algorithm is trying to maximize retention. Yeah, and here is basically, I'm not saying this is kind of, uh, a, in, we are gonna show that in this market, it doesn't coincide, but maybe there are some markets where uh, basically clicking rate coincides with utility. It, it depends, I guess, on the market, but it's not always true. So we call kind of this idea of maximized retention, the selfish kind of matching. And on the left, we call it the kind of max, the social optimal matching. So uh, uh, the idea here is modeling 
uh, what is the probability, what is the matching induced by maximizing retention and then capturing uh, the loss of social welfare. And if you go to the next slide, we wanted to model this as a centralized matching. And so the social welfare aspect is very kind of a very classical problem of weighted matching on by bipartite graphs. So the idea is we have a few assumptions where we assume that basically uh, weights or the, the preference from users on the left side are known to users on the right side. So the problem here is not inferring the, the kind of the, um, the, the weights, but actually computing a central matching. Um, and why this is a kind of algorithmic in, in problem is because you cannot match everybody to their best preference because basically uh, you, you're going to have there is like a, it's not like a, in Spotify, basically everybody can hear the same song here because we are kind of inspired by online dating. Not everybody can be dating the same person. So, so the idea is that you need to choose a matching such that every user on the left has only one kind of um, assignation on the right. And in fact, it's a probability assignation. And so if you already have the weights, the, the problem of solving this to maximize the utility of the users is a well-known and solved problem. It's basically what is this classical edge-weighted bipartite matching. So the idea is that we want to maximize the utility of users on the left and the utility of users on the right, because it, this is a two-sided matching. Uh, what is the utility of a user is basically the uh, each agent basically gets assigned a probability. So imagine the inspiration here is, a way, is, is what is the, why we use probabilities is because the probabilities can be the visibility. So imagine you get assigned an agent, a user with probability 50%, another one, sorry, 40%, another one 60. So it means basically it, it's kind of, uh, you can think about the visibility. So I don't know if you, it, it gives, um, it's a random matching, but it, it gives 60% of the time to show you this person, 40% the other one. And then the, the, the user can choose which one to decide. So what is the total utility of a user is basically the, this idea we, like I said, we assume that weights are known. So user I uh, no, uh, knows his preference toward user J, and then it's basically how much the algorithm kind of presents or assigns that user. So, so this is kind of very classical. Uh, we wanted to compare what is basically, this is the optimal ranking that we can use to maximize welfare. And if you go to the next slide, we wanted to compare it. And this is kind of the novelty of the, the paper is modeling what would uh, a platform designer wanted to um, maximize user retention would do. So here we kind of bring uh, one new ingredient that is uh, now users have a probability of coming back to the system. So imagine you, if you go, you are using a dating site. Um, if you don't receive good matchings, then you are going to leave probably the system and don't come back. Um, so basically the idea is if you receive very low quality matchings, you go back, you, 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 don't, you don't come back to the system, you leave the system. But on the other stream, uh, if you're looking for, and this is the assumption, if you're looking for long-term relationships, you, you receive a very, uh, really good matching. Basically, uh, you also are gonna date her or him or um, for a long time, and then you also are not gonna come back to the system. So that's the idea. So if you receive, so if you see this, if you see the, we model this by a probability Q. And if you see this graph on the right with colors, so these are different kind of curves, but the idea is that if a user receives an utility very low, then the probability of coming back to the system is very low. If a user receives a matching that is very high, so this is normalized between zero and one, then the user also is gonna leave the system. And that's uh, where basically the algorithm wants to play, is want to, it wants to give um, 
good utility, but not so good and not so bad, such that the user can back to the system. So we model this as a Markov process where basically the two states being in the system, basically using the dating in the system or not. I see a hand by Tobias. Yeah, sorry, I was just a clarification question, but I think you're coming to this. I was just wondering if I should think about this in, in the terms of the repeated game setting, you know, there were so to say there are multiple because I don't see a subscript T uh, where I join the system and then I decide so to say in the next period to keep being the system or to drop out. Um, but OK, I understand this as a Markov process that, that you. Yeah, might so, okay. so, so, so the idea is like, yeah, it's in every so imagine. This is how it will work is in every time uh, so a user comes. It basically, and then the ranking has to kind of compute a ranking for every user at time t. And then it tries to maximize the, it, it's going to create a ranking to maximize the probability of the user uh, coming back to the system. So that's kind of one iteration. And then basically users interact. And then you have a second iteration where you need to reprocess the ranking and so on. So, so it's an iterated version. Uh, that's why, for example, Sometimes a user can be dating, so it's going to be out of the system, but then it, it could come back to the system again. And yeah, sorry, just, just, uh, just another clarification question. I said, okay, that's sort of say, um, this makes, of course, given that it's a mark process makes us firm forward looking. Um, but do users also factor in, so to say their potential utility in the, in the upcoming periods. Um, when making the decision to rejoin the system or not. So are, are those consumers, so to say, myopic in the sense that they only consider like the, the immediate gratification of dating or not dating? Right. Yeah, yeah, we, we that, that's a good point. And I think that's a nice extension. Yeah, uh, users are considered myopic in, in the sense that they only, based on their previous interaction, so, so the idea is, Based on what I, the utility received on my last kind of interaction with the system, I will choose what I do next. Um, but the system designer is not myopic, it's long term. In fact, we model that the system, instead of trying to choose the probability of retaining the user on the next iteration, it will compute basically the long term uh, retention of the user. In fact, because this is a Markov chain, you can compute basically the percentage of time that the user is going to be in the system. So that's the limiting probability. So the, so the designer is trying to maximize the long term retention, but users are kind of model as, as short term myopic. And in that sense, the, so what is the central designer trying to maximize is to create a ranking such that the number, the expected number of users in the system is maximized. So basically we want to, uh, they want to give uh, assign utilities to users such that they are in the they 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 spend most of the time in the system so so this is the modeling and if you go to the next Hello. slide we have a question here as well yeah there is a question okay. uh, I, uh, I have an uh, application question and it's related to the fact that in when you look at the system where you maximize the social welfare, am I correct that there is no dynamic there? So people are, um, are not basically deciding to go back to the system or not once assigned. And if so, probably that's just because of the myotic. Uh, Sanction because I, I could see also in the other system people that got an unlucky blow because uh, in the pipe efficient uh, maximization, in the pipe efficient allocation, you got uh, uh, someone you are not very happy with to go back to the system. Right? It's not that that doesn't happen. I see. So, I, I, if I heard correctly, so, so yes, yeah, this is kind of uh... <laughs> Uh, yeah. for, oh, for analytical purposes, for we model it as a like. Model it. Oh, I can hear myself back. So yeah, maybe you could meet yourself. In the sense that we want to maximize 
the retention of users on the next iteration. And, and basically, once we do the results are for the yeah for the myopic sense, uh, we also do in the paper kind of simulations in the long term. But the idea is we don't the, the optimization on the long term. It's it's kind of intractable and kind of it's an open challenge. So we well uh, basically our central designer is like a myopic optimization. He wants to maximize the retention on the next uh, iteration and so on, and it does that. At every period, but I think it's uh, it would be much more interesting to to see if they can model it in the long term. But I think it, it's 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 a very challenging question. So so from from a technical point of view, I don't think uh, maximizing long term uh, functions is, is 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 most of the time is not analytically tractable, and also modeling kind of the users in the long term is also uh, is difficult. So so in this first iteration, yeah, it, it's kind of uh, we model everything as a myopic, and we did simulation of, of kind of this myopic, but in the long term. And so, so actually, that also allow us to, to compute what we call the the price of anarchy, borrowed from game theory. So, is this idea of what would be the worst ratio? So, in in one kind of a snap of the market, what would be the worst ratio compared to the next period if the central designer tries to maximize retention versus maximizing um, the um, the the optimal welfare. So, so the idea this is a ratio between zero and one. One would be that there is no loss, and and zero would mean that users have like an infinite loss of user. And if you see the equation, so it, it's this is where we wanna. When we find the price of anarchy, so this is the worst ratio between the optimal retention and the social optimum, it's independent of the weight. So, so this is where we did some of analytical work where we uh, we, we don't fix the weights, but we find the, the kind of the worst case that can happen for any condition. And so the results are kind of the main findings of the results, kind of high level, are that the price of anarchy. Uh, doesn't depend of the family of weights, but it depends only on, on, on the function Q. So what it was this function Q, this was basically the probability that the user come back to the system. And this has kind of, in a way it's intuitive because basically it's saying the, the amount of kind of, of, of loss that the selfish algorithm can kind of take from the users only depends on the behavior of the users. Um, so basically, this loss, the loss of social utility is primarily caused by users' actions, and thus it can be kind of improved by modifying users' behaviors. So in other words, the system ability to exploit users is only limited by the own action of the users. Um, uh, and this is interesting because basically it, it means that if, uh, if users kind of change their interaction. So if they leave the system when they receive, uh, for example, uh, medium utility, then the system has to kind of change its function to give them more utility. And, and we're going to actually show a little bit about that. The second also main finding is that because this only depends on the functional form of how users interact with the system, but not on the number of users. So, so it means that the um, if the market increases, then the efficiency of the market doesn't decrease with size. So it, uh, the potential benefits scale up without sacrificing social efficiency. And then given that, for example, the, um, so uh, coming back to the main finding is that based on the um, ability to exploit users is only limited by their own actions, we investigated the idea of modeling user behavior in a competitive market. So what happens uh, here, remember the, the Markov chain was you are in the system or out of the system. So it's basically you are looking for matches in, in one system or not, but what if there is a more competition? What if once you are not in one system looking for matches, you are in another one? What happens then? So we actually, when we model this, um, we show that as competition grows, as 
as uh, when the user has more and more platforms to choose too much, then the price of anarchy converges to one. So basically, when there is competition, this is kind of this idea of the invisible hand effect. Um, then retaining users is kind of coincides with giving them the, the maximal utility because basically uh, there is when there's more competition, users have more kind of ability to change and look for other kind of sites that can give them more utility. So, so what we show is that in the infinity, when there is uh, basically perfect competition, which is not true in the real world, but in that case, the price of anarchy is one. So meaning um, even when the platform designers are trying to maximize retention, this is equivalent to maximizing utility, but only when there is kind of perfect competition. So, so this is kind of the, the idea that the loss of social welfare only depends on, 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 the, on the whole system and how users decide when um, to leave the system. So if you, yeah, so if you go, for example, to the next slide, we show a kind of a synthetic idea of this. So for example, here the idea was uh, some kind of analytical results showing different um, probabilities of the users coming back to the system. So on the left, there is, this is kind of the, the curves of what is the probability of coming back to the system. And on the right is kind of the price of anarchy modulated by this alpha. So the idea is that uh, a higher the alpha, for example, is the higher the utility they need to receive to remain in the system. So that's is the idea that it, once there's more, uh, when they have they, their outside option is higher, when they have more competition, they are more, they need more utility to remain in the system because another system is giving them much uh, higher utility. So this is kind of the, the intuitive idea is that as the, there is more competition, we can kind of modulate this as an alpha, the price of anarchy kind of uh, increases because uh, users are kind of more, they're more kind of restrictive and they want to perceive more utility to remain in the system. And to finish, so again, kind of as uh, in the other study, we also wanted to see how this is in real life, uh, especially because there is kind of one assumption that it's, it's very restrictive and it's actually this function of Q. So we show all our analytical results depend on that this Q is concave and that the utility of receiving zero is zero and then the probability of if you receive one, it's also zero. And uh, this kind of, it is a big assumption and we wanted to see, uh, create an experiment with human users and see basically if uh, when this doesn't hold, if some of our results also remain true. So if you go to the second slide, uh, we kind of design an experiment. Uh, in this case, it's not a two-sided kind of matching, but a one-sided matching. Um, so the idea was as following. So we wanted to be as close as the model that we presented, but without, so we wanted to know the weights and the preferences of users. So to do that, we kind of created a game where users come and they kind of interact with um, slot machines. But for each user, the expected payoff of a slot machine was different. So the idea is, for example, player J uh, can be assigned to five slot machines, A, B, C, and D. Each of them is gonna give them, uh, in every round, they basically they play with slot machine and it gives them a, a payoff, a real amount of, of, of money in cents that is normally distributed with some median. But the, here's the key thing is that the average payoff of a user and a slot machine is, is, is kind of independent for each kind of, so, okay, so player J with slot machine A has a payoff of five cents, for example, and the same player with slot machine B has 10, 10 cents of payoff. So it's a, it's a higher payoff. 
But the thing is, we as the system designer know this, but the user doesn't know it. So the idea is that users have to basically interact with different slot machines that give these uh, random uh, payoffs. And once interacting with the uh, slot machine, it will basically, for example, it starts with slot machine A and it receives, I don't know, two cents, five cents, and then the player can decide, okay, I'm gonna continue playing with this slot machine or I'm gonna change to another one. When they choose to change to a new slot machine, then is where we operationalize our algorithmic ranking. Basically, we uh, assign them a new slot machine and then the user then again interacts with the slot machine and then it decides based on the payoffs that it received, if he wants to continue, he or she wants to continue with that, that slot machine or wants to change. So there are two ways, so there are two kind of if you are a rational user, why you want to change is because you think that a, another slot machine can give you better uh, uh, payoffs. And we also added like a, a thinking of competition that there is an outside payment. So at every turn, the user can leave the experiment and he's going to receive a, a, an outside payment, say, of uh, $5. So basically the idea is they know how much they can gain so there is a minimum that they can gain for sure. And they only are going to be kind of in this sense, uh, representing dating if they are winning more than they could be winning in another kind of uh, market, which is why we give them like a, this idea of outside payment. And we have basically also the two kind of algorithmic decisions. One is trying to assign users to maximize their their utility. So again, we wanted to assign users to slot machines to maximize the average uh, payoff they receive. And the other one is the selfish kind of centralized algorithm that wants to maximize the probability that the user uh, remains in the system. And this is operationalized as uh, we wanted to maximize that the user changes a slot machines. So we, uh, so if a user stays in one slot machine in, in the whole period, then it's like it's dating and it's not kind of using the system. So we wanted to, the selfish kind of algorithm, want to maximize the probability that the user changes of machine without leaving the system. So I hope it, it's clear the experiment. So if you go to the, Second slide, the next slide, maybe the, we show the main results. Yeah, so, okay, so, okay. So in the, the top graph basically shows the distribution of payoffs that basically this is the weights of payoff from users to slot machines. So this is basically what they would have received if they were assigned uh, randomly. But on the lower end, we can see the two conditions. So based on that distribution, what um, the distribution of payoffs on the left is what they act, the actual users receive when they were matched using uh, the optimum matching or what we call the firm algorithm. And if you, you see what is happening is that the, the payoff distribution is kind of a move toward the right. So basically, uh, users were gaining more payoff than what would they would have received if they were uh, assigned randomly. So, so that's good. Basically, it means that our optimum matching is kind of increasing their payoffs. And if you see on the right, this is the pay the realized payoffs when the users were interacting with the system through uh, the selfish algorithm. And now you can see that actually the payoffs were kind of uh, shifted toward the left. So now users are gaining less uh, payoffs than they would on the random world. The the um, so 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 basically there is a, is a, is a there is a impact in the payoffs they are receiving. And one of the kind of the things that are really interesting for me is that and like I said, at any round, the participants may choose to be matched again with the algorithm, or they can actually 
uh, say I'm finished and I want to receive my outside payment. And in this case, the outside payment was six cents per um, per round that they haven't played. And what is interesting that if you see, I, I actually this uh, pointed line on the right, lower right graph is actually showcasing the six cents and it's basically what is in in a way um what we show here is that the selfish algorithm was giving trying to give users a six cents plus delta so so it was actually it learned through the interaction of users that users needed to receive at least six cents to stay in the system because otherwise they will leave the system so so basically uh, if you go to the next slide, it's going to be clearer. Uh, what is surprising is that only, so this is not coded in the algorithm. The algorithm didn't know the this outside option, but here, so on the, on the left, this is kind of the average payment that they received. So in average, users received $1.12 or 112 cents. Uh, in the optimal algorithm and 61 cents on the selfish. So it's surprisingly that basically because the upside option was six, six, 60 cents, the algorithm kind of learned through this interaction with users that they needed to receive uh, the upside option plus a delta to be kind of to be remained a, a, to increase the engagement. So if you see the right uh, kind of plot, it actually this shows the engagement rate. So, so this is the probability of users uh, match, asking for a rematch, asking for being assigned a new kind of um, slot machine. So again, it, it satisfies what we wanted. So the social optimum uh, where they receive bigger payoffs, only 40% of the time they ask to be rematched. And in the selfish, where we actually wanted to increase engagement rate, we actually wanted to optimize the amount of basically users asking to be rematched without leaving the system. 60% of the time they were basically changing the, the, the slot machine. So, I, I, so we, we kind of, the algorithm was actually doing what it was meant to do. Um, and then basically what is the kind of loss of sociality of social utility in this case is half. So basically users by the algorithm by uh, uh, increasing engagement rate decrease the utility of users by a uh, uh, half and like i said this is actually modulated by this um, outside option was kind of a surprising results and yeah so with that and i don't want to continue i wanted to finish so overall the the kind of main finding here is that um Again, we learned uh, that the um, that the utility that the kind of system can kind of take out of the users is always kind of a function of what the user's behavior is. In, in this case, the behavior of the users was kind of modulated by how much they expect that they can be winning outside of not using the system. So this is the outside option. So so this again goes back to our theoretical results that basically. Um, this, the the probability or the expectation of the users of what how much uh, how much utility they wanna perceive or win from the users from the system is basically is gonna uh, fit the system and actually give them exactly that expectation. So so it creates this kind of feedback loop where where users are actually uh, engaging with the system and the system to is giving them in, in a way what they want or, or in, in implicitly but only, only the kind of the minimum to retain them. So, so this was kind of a, a nice result where the theoretical and empirical results kind of, of go together. On the other side, the, I'm not going to show, but when we studied this, if the retention of a user was following this assumption, what we call this concavity, it wasn't the case. In fact, we believe because first, here the the users were very risky so basically they're only risking six cents so it makes sense that when they receive a even though a user is receiving for example two cents two cents even though he could should have leave the system and received the six cents maybe because 
the risk of losing four cents is not that much. They they keep continuing in the system. So that's why basically we believe we, we didn't have this concavity that we were asking, but, but it's still one of the main results remain that is basically this idea of the price of anarchy is modulated by their behavior. And with that, I, I, I wanted to finish and, and ask for any comments. Perfect. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Thank you.